Good afternoon. Welcome to the auditorium on day five of web for today's panel discussion. The edge of four E's, entrepreneurship, environment, equity, and economy. My name is Abdurrahman Basagir. I'm the lead of partnerships and developmental programs in the Strategic National Advancement Division here at KAUST. And I'm pleased to introduce to you the moderator and the panelists for this session. Iman al Haji, founder of Saudi Youth Sustainability, who earned her PhD in material science and engineering at KAUST in 2022. Congratulations, Iman. Erin Smith, co founder of Ocean Soul. Sam Marshall, co founder of Fertana. By the end of this session, the moderator will take questions from the in-person and virtual audience, and our panelists will be happy to answer your questions. And a quick note before we end, join us for the 5 p.m. keynote lecture by the international football player, Didier Drogba. And to close day five, for a very interesting session as well, in the same auditorium, join us for an evening of jazz with the Mavis Pan Quintet. Oh, Kaust, I'm impressed everywhere. Lastly, we have a surprise for you. Look under your chair. If you find a sticker, you won a gift by Ocean Soul. Once this session is over, please grab your gift from the lobby area. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome, everyone. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, definitely, after the session, you could look into different seats and find the empty one and get your gift. So let's get it started. We're here continuing this fascinating adventure into the ish transforming the world we know. I'll take you on a journey with the founders of two innovative businesses with environmental sustainability at the heart of their mission. In particular, we will discuss the edges of four E's, entrepreneurship, environment, equity, and economy. Now, now let's welcome Sam Franken Marshall. Sam Marshall is the co-founder of Bartana Global, after more, more than two year decades in agriculture architecture industry, Sam felt limited by the uh, functional properties of conventional building materials. His search for a material that could do more and drive the design process in the 21st century is what led him to the development of Bartana technologies. Sam is most passionate about eliminating climate negative impacting carbon from the world, consistently seeking new methods and improving technologies in all aspects of design and construction. Let's welcome Sam. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here today. It's an honor to be here. Thank you to Kaust for having me as well. We have a lot to get to today, so I'm going to go through this fairly quickly. Uh, after this, we'll obviously have a Q&A session up on stage, but we'll also be open to all of you for questions. Um, so to introduce Bartana, uh, just very quickly, it's our first net carbon negative building material. Uh, what we saw was in the world, and in particularly given my background as architecture, is that the construction industry is responsible for 38%, 38% of all the world's CO2 emissions. Um, there have been incremental solutions. Uh, a lot of people are you know, making small steps to do less bad. But in general, there's no net positive good. Uh, the end game is what we want to do is reduce not only uh, in increments, but what we also want to do is make, be a positive force for good, and make sure that we're able to remove carbon out of the atmosphere. Uh, Partana does just that. It's uh, technology through curing remove CO2, and it's made from recycled materials. Uh, we use recycled brine uh, it's from the desalination plants. Uh, we recycle steel waste. We absorb through uh, the reactions of these uh, materials, CO2 directly from the atmosphere. It's not a sequestration. 
It actually, through curing, absorbs directly from the atmosphere, and then we can uh, uh, use recycled product as aggregate. The three carbon benefits are it avoids and removes carbon, it eliminates ocean impacts, and it, uh, uh, you know, uh, prides itself on uh, local material sourcing, so cut down on all the shipments. Um, there are two different types of carbon credits. Uh, the carbon credit market, I think, has been very pivotal and influential in encouraging companies around the world to create carbon negative uh, building materials. The first is the avoidance offset. So if you're able to replace uh, what was a, a highly intensive carbon emitting process, uh, you can claim that avoidance as a credit. The second is removal. Now, typically removal is only uh, limited to, let's say, forests or the blue carbon sinks that exist around the world. Uh, what we're able to do is um, take those ideas where we're absorbing uh, mixed technology and nature and lead the way into a new urban era through creating a gray carbon vertical. So what we have is a green carbon vertical that absorbs carbon. We have a blue carbon vertical that absorbs carbon. This is the first man-made product that we're calling the gray carbon vertical that absorbs carbon. Uh, it's the first uh, building material that not only avoids carbon emission, but also absorbs it. Uh, again, as I said, there are incremental steps that are being taken to absorb uh, some carbon, but uh, in, in general, uh, uh, it's just less bad. What we're trying to do is uh, full positive. Where we thrive are, are the areas where uh, uh, desalination plants exist. Um, you know, Brine, obviously, once it's uh, dispersed into the ocean, falls down to the ocean floor and suffocates uh, all life that exists. Um, the ESG benefits of this, human health, we're not uh, emitting any particulates that, uh, in general, uh, have a very negative impact on health. Um, because we're not using fresh water, because we're using a recycled water, we're able to conserve pure drinking water. Uh, durable ho uh, housing ownership, we're, we're doing a program in the Bahamas that's building a lot of affordable housing. Uh, what we're able to do is, through the uh, carbon credit program, uh, afford new paths to, uh, to people that uh, need to get into uh, housing. Um, and of course, because it's made out of brine, the seawater makes it uh, a lot more durable. Uh, the seawater actually makes it stronger. Uh, and so instead of uh, deteriorating uh, the, the house, it actually uh, does good. So how do we get here? The process of innovation. Uh, instead of looking at all the constraints that we had as a negative, what we really tried to do is embrace those. And so really, innovation is, you know, do you have an idea? Uh, maybe you don't understand it from the beginning, but at least start with the idea. You can understand it later, but let's try to figure out, okay, what can we use around us to uh, create a net positive good? In other words, have a clear understanding of what is important and accept what is not impeding your goal. Huge step, just take the first step, just do it. Uh, it. Whatever your idea is, just take that first step and start. Um, embrace the constraints. That's what I mean by uh, not narrowing your focus, but widening your focus. In the Bahamas, uh, obviously, there's a lot of constraints that are there. What we try to do is use those for the positive. The basic definition of symbiotic is interaction between two different organisms living in close physical association. That's a good thing. Uh, figure out what those uh, commonalities are and try to work with those. Uh, there will be failures, particularly when you start out. Reflect on those failures, not as failures, but what did you learn from those? Uh, and then over a course of years, uh, you'll be able to make progress just as long as you're able to pivot. Whatever those failures may be, just pivot away from them and figure out what the good uh, parts are. Uh, ending up at never, ever, ever give up. Thank you, guys. Sam. Now let's welcome Erin Smith. Erin Smith is the CEO of Ocean Soul, a social enterprise that upcycles flip-flops uh, found along the beaches and waterways of Kenya. Erin says so she's from Nairobi, Kenya. Come on, Erin, let's welcome her all. And uh, let's play the video now. Last year we recycled over 500,000 flip-flops. We are making something which is so beautiful. My name is Francis Mutua. I'm a flip-flop artist. My heart will save the world. More than 3 billion people in the world wear flip-flops. 
after you are dumped and they go into our oceans. Flip flops are brought to our shores by the tides of the Indian Ocean. We collect the flip flops, saving life in the sea. We first wash them, do the cuffing, do some sanding to smooth the edge. In one day, we can make six to eight animals. Over 900 Kenyans are supported by employment and collection of flip flops. So it's manual, not machine. It's something to be seen. I love my work. I'm proud. No? Uh, come, yeah, come to our mic. Hold on one second. Yes. Oh, that was better. Yes? Uh, let me. I think. Is it pulling my dress off? Uh, yeah, could you go to Mar uh, in the back seat? Excuse me. <laughs> We're having a technical problem. Remind everyone who came a bit late that we have a surprise gift. So. Uh, look underneath your seat, and if you find a shark sticker, you'll get a shark from Ocean Soul. Uh, there is a little hint. If you come to the front, maybe you'll find more. So, okay, let's welcome now? Aaron again. <laughs> you can hear me now, yes. So hi, yes, I'm Aaron Smith. Thank you all uh, for having us here at KAUST. Um, some of you may have seen some of the artwork uh, that is in front of the library. That is what some of my team that's here in the audience have made um, and that we brought all the way from Kenya to show you all. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Ocean Soul, our business model, but where I'm also going to answer a, a permanent question called what the flip-flop, which is always asked us why are there so many flip-flops? So let's go through our story here. So our mission is very... Um, you know, one focus, and that is to take flip-flops from our 1,500-kilometer coastline of Kenya that goes from Somalia to Tanzania and East Africa. We have five major rivers in Kenya, one including the Nile. We have major waterways that connect our villages and our cities. These end up being polluted from industrial waste, from local waste, from villager waste, not on purpose, but because of our waste management um, issues and infrastructure lacking in Kenya and in other parts around the world. So we have a mission, which is to take those flip-flops, make beautiful art like you see here, and advocate for ocean conservation as well as community impact through employment. So that is what we do, and that is all we do. You saw the video. So let me talk about our company and what our pillars of our business model is. We clean beaches. So how do we do that? We do that with community organizations all up and down the coastline of Kenya and through the waterways. They self-organize. They um, usually are women-based um, that need jobs in high-impact communities. They organize themselves a bit like a pyramid scheme where somebody at the top is kind of the manager, then they have four people, and then they have four people, and they go out and clean trash up and down um, across Kenya, and we, as Ocean Soul, buy those flip-flops from them. That is our raw material to make our art. Employment is a big thing for me personally. My background was in private equity. I saw that employment and differentiation and leadership and other ways really makes a difference in the value of a company. So employment to me is about fair wages, healthcare, food, um, great working conditions, time off, 
People should come to work and be proud of what they do, which you heard about in the video, but they should also have support from an organization to make the change that we need to make. And that's what a big belief for me and for the company itself. We believe in women empowerment. I try as much as possible to have 50% of our workforce be women. They can start out as either picking up trash or they can start out as washers. And we try to upskill them into some of the artists. Traditionally in Kenya, our artists are men. Um, they come from certain tribes throughout Kenya. They um, used to uh, take trees down and carve with wood and make curios, maybe like you've seen some salad utensils or a giraffe or something like that. That used to be the, tra uh, the biggest trade in craftsmanship. And now we have taught a lot of these artisans to now use this new medium, which is flip-flops. So the women are also through a skilled program trying to get them to that level of craftsmanship. We educate, we educate youth. We talk about whether it's our social enterprise business model, trash to cash, conservation, recycling. We try as much as possible as we come to universities or forums like this where we learn new things like Sam's Bricks. And we like to take that message home to our country and to our youth and explain that the world is full of opportunities. So we do a lot of that. And then last but not least, we advocate for art. The bottom is all of these endangered species that we've made out of flip-flops. You can see the gorilla, the panda, the pangolin. These are, we try to make statement pieces so that people are aware of not just the flip-flop problem, but also in terms of um, wildlife conservation. So we're committed to the UN Sustainable Goals. When I took over the, the company, it was actually like a project when I first took it over. Um, I knew that it wasn't sustainable. It was looking for donations. It was kind of, ha you know, havocly, you know, trying to sell things. I said, we need to run this like a business. It needs to become a social enterprise where we sell art, make money, and do more good. So we kind of rebuilt the organization starting in 2016, 2017 with some of the team. We became very mission oriented. We were not scatterbrained. We knew what we wanted to do, which was take flip flops and make art and promote conservation and community impact. We have a profit sharing program at uh, Ocean Soul called our employee welfare. Um, we take all the profits now. I don't drive a Range Rover, I wish, but we take all the um, profits back, we put it back into the business. We either buy new machinery, we hire new people because we've gone into new markets, we give better benefits, um, improve healthcare, more vacation, and we donate to a thing called the Employee Welfare, which is self-managed by the team. So they pick the leaders, that money comes in, we match it. Some of the, uh, the gentlemen have bought, you know, uh, boda bodas, which are like um, picky pickies, what do you call them, motorcycles. They've bought bicycles. They've put kids through school. They've put th kids through university. And this is their own fund in which they can self-select and borrow from. So that is a huge thing and very important to me personally as well. It works really well with the team. We also knew we needed to do two very important things. We needed to be sustainable. Not only sustainable in our operations, kind of end to end within the uh, workshop, but we needed to be sustainable ongoing so that this program and project and business could last for years to come. It needs to go on and we need, and then the second thing was to be repeatable. We have, because of my background in business, we have boxed this up. We have standard operating procedures. We know how to run this thing. We know how to measure impact. We know how to measure productivity. We know how to measure results. And we can go do that someplace like Guatemala or Honduras or India. Whoever wants us, we have this business model of a solution kind of waiting to solve a problem. And that was a really core kind of driver for me in the business model. And last but not least, I think one thing that's really important for any type of social impact and change is we are an open collaboration platform. I used to be a coder, believe it or not, back in the day when they had COBOL and things you wouldn't know, but I believed in open source. So we are a business where people can come and collaborate with us, meaning they can, my shoes I'm wearing, there's a French designer named Chloe who 
co-designed these shoes with us. So that was a benefit. We have people that donate money to us. We attend a, a country music festival in America called Rock the Ocean. We get money from those proceeds. We have raised money for other organizations. So we've created this ecosystem where we're giving, we're receiving, we're designing together, and that is what's really excelled us forward and made the sustainability of what we need to do to change. So the biggest question is why are there so many flip-flops? And you know, uh, we always get asked, are you gonna run out of flip-flops? Are you gonna run out of raw um, materials? But you need to think back and you start to look around the world that we all live in, Three billion to three and a half billion people wear flip-flops. Some type of slipper, bata bata, it's in different languages, shoe. You start to notice it just go out into some major cities or coastal towns. That is their shoe of choice. It is an affordable shoe. It is made in horrendous conditions, usually probably with oil starting in this region, taking it to China, working in very um, you know, terrible conditions, and they produce them in billions and billions and sell them globally. So these shoes end up somewhere, and where they end up is our ocean. Again, one man's luxury is another man's necessity. You know, I get often I'm speaking in Milan or in Paris or something, they're like, oh yeah, I lost my shoe on Saint-Tropez. It's like, that's not the flip-flop we're worried about. We're worried about the villagers, the people in the cities that have to dispose and they wear these shoes out. So much so we see them sewn together, glued together so that they can have a longer life. This is the type of shoes that we work with and these are the type of shoes that are polluting our oceans, our waterways, and they're very destructive because they don't move. They block clean waterways, they do sewage, everything. They're far more destructive than toothbrushes and other types of plastics that we see. So why are they floating around the ocean? Well, let me just give you a quick example here of just East Africa. We have, we're in a unique position where we get both north and south equatorial tides. Now with these tides, the sad part is a lot of our mammals, our sea mammals, our turtles and other marine wildlife take these tides to move around these oceans. So what happens, what's happened to us and what we've discovered is basically Turtles in particular, they follow these tides and they end up on the same beaches that are just, uh, have the most destruction from ocean trash. And that is really where we started from in terms of solving that problem. So Kenya, sadly, is right in the middle of these two tides intersection. It's coming from all over Asia. They get caught in these tides. They hit Seychelles, sometimes Maldives, Madagascar, and it makes its way and ends up on our ocean. I mean, on our beaches there. So let me quick case study to give you an example because it's hard to believe. I went down to Haiti to really research this and Port-au-Prince is where the circle is, which is the capital of Haiti. Haiti was started out, you know, we all know about Haiti in terms of its current status, but it was a lo lovely little Caribbean island. Um, and probably 80 years ago when the local dump was created, it was mostly food, uh, biodegradable types of materials. You know, we didn't have the plastic, we didn't have the textiles, we didn't have the volume. So so that local dump that's in the, in the industrial area probably was fit for purpose, but now it is not. The volume has exceeded so much, and there's so much plastic there. What happens is the tide rises coming in, and it actually takes almost half of the dump out with it. So if you live where those red arrows are, you just get this massive amount of trash that just starts to come out during monsoons or hurricanes, and it just starts to hit the beaches again. And then 80% of it just continues out and then goes and flows flows into those orange areas and hits other islands. And this is prevalent in a lot, and I'm sure if you talk to a lot of your marine scientists in the room or at the school here, they will have seen this um, constant interaction throughout, especially the Indian Ocean, the Caribbean Sea, and some of the other places. So this is why we have so many flip-flops in the ocean. The volume of people, the tides, and where they follow the tides. So, and then you end up, we have a place like this. This is a lady that works for us. We've supported for some time. Florence, she, you know, she has a whole group of people that clean trashes. This is a local waterway in Nairobi. As you can see, it's filthy. We provide her boots and gloves to do her job. She has about 20 people that work for them. She's collecting flip-flops and bringing that. But that is what our rivers look like. So that is why there are so many flip-flops. That is why Ocean Soul's here advocating for change. 
So ideally, our biggest goal, because we dream big in Kenya, we're big hustlers, um, we want to go everywhere we can to help solve this problem. We do feel like we're a solution in a box. We know the problem. We know why it's here. We know how to solve it. And we hopefully one day we can be on a global platform. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sharon. Let's invite our panelists to be with us here on stage. We're going to dive deeper into your stories, inspiring ones. So I'd love to ask you first, Sam, about the factors that are influencing uh, the way you're transforming communities in Bartana Global and through your journey? Well, what we've created is a, a product that can be used in, in any part of the globe. It's really about service, really about uh, creating a pathway for people to um, you know, build with sustainable building materials that uh, typically aren't affordable. A lot of the conversation around uh, green materials and, and building practices, if it's green, it's more expensive, or it's, it's more difficult, or uh, there's a, an inherent barrier to that. So what we've done is taken away those barriers and have enabled a process that is based on materials that are locally available and uh, processes that, uh, for example, can build affordable housing. And if you would give one tip in creating new edges, what would it be? One tip in creating a new edge. Well, I think, I think you have to uh, have something to say, right? And if you can define what that is, what, what is inside you, I, I think if you stick to that and you never waver from that mission, um, you know, eventually you will find a place for it. Uh, my partner, Rick Fox, always says, go where you're wanted. Right? It may not be for everybody, but it doesn't make it, uh, um, you know, what is valuable is what that voice inside is saying and then finding a place to say it. Beautiful. Yeah. Aaron, tell us about Ocean Soul and how are you transforming communities there in Kenya and beyond? I think um, our major impact on communities is the commitment to bring and work with the communities and work at a grassroots level to get in and figure out where, you know, Kenya is a huge hustle country. We are, everybody's working multiple jobs, everybody's willing to do stuff. And sometimes you need to bring uh, the opportunities to these communities and explain how it benefits them. And I think that's one thing we do, especially through our beach cleanups, because on the coast, um, it's been overfished. Um, we have terrible reef restoration problems. And the biggest impact is not only just to the fishermen's, but to the fishermen's wives and their families in terms of earning income. So we try as much as possible to get as close to those communities and work with them to figure out ways to create jobs. And how did you um, move all the way from the U.S. to Kenya? And you've been living there since 2014, correct? Um, how? Well, I, made, I made my way um, a long way from the U.S. I left the U.S. about 20-some, 20 25 years ago, maybe. I worked in the U.K., Sydney, Singapore. Uh, I worked in global businesses, um, and in, I was a CIO for British Telecom, and I was in private equity, and then ultimately I was sent to uh, Middle East and Africa. I worked in, I've been in Saudi before and doing buying out fintech companies, so I ended up retiring somewhat in Nairobi, if you will. That's fantastic because you're always aspiring to do more impact yes. and you're always looking for impact wherever you go. Uh, Today we're experiencing many different global goals including climate change, biodiversity loss, and with our, along with our um, popula uh, population. One of the issues that we are concerning about today and we're concerned about is leaving no one behind. Tell us about how you empowered youth and adults alike in border countries to address sustainable development goals, and what advice would you give to those who would like to make similar impact, and what kind of SDG goals are most connected to you, Sam? 
<laughs> Maybe. Too, too many questions? <laughs> okay. Simple question, right? Uh, no, thanks for the question. I think, look, uh, uh, and, and, and all you guys have heard this, right? It's um, let's leave it to the youth. Uh, we have to make a change. Um, what, you know, and, and then what, now what, right? And so I, I think the biggest advice, I'll start there, is, again, finding that voice, um, knowing you matter, knowing that the choices you make, uh, whether it's, um, you know, on, on the commercial level uh, to how you live, uh, impact, um, uh, you know, the global environmental issues that we have. I think, um, you know, one of the biggest issues is, of course, in, in fighting uh, global uh, climate change is this idea of, of greed and consumption, right? And so I think we all have to start there, right? And then beyond that, uh, how do we uh, uh, make an impact beyond that? So Partana, look, I'm an architect by trade, uh, not a material scientist. Uh, I've become one. Uh, but, you know, seeing that need of how do we uh, make beautiful buildings? How do we make uh, structures that are affordable? You shouldn't have to be a millionaire to afford a home. You shouldn't have to be wealthy to have a basic standard of living. How do we serve uh, it, it, through a process and through uh, a material that uh, not only is accessible around the planet, but also um, is able to be used? As a result, we figured out uh, you know, a, a cement that can, uh, uh, a concrete that can absorb CO2, uh, that, uh, that creates carbon credits then all of a sudden we have a, a financial pathway that helps bridge the gap between what I'm calling the global north and the global south, which is an established world up uh, towards the uh, you know, north of this planet to uh, an area that is in desperate need in, in, in general of uh, being able to have the resources to develop at an equal pace. And so I think uh, there's, there's multiple verticals within that, but it all started with the, the one place of um, having something to say and, and making sure that every day, sticking to that. Beautiful. Yeah. Aaron, tell us about how you empowered communities in Kenya, and if there's any personal story that you encounter and would love to share. Well, that's a, um, interesting. I think kind of what's the lessons learned when you're trying to be a change maker in a social kind of impact area. I mean, one is, and, and we spoke with the Dr. Sebastian in the marine area, we were talking about helicopter kind of scientists. The same thing with helicopter management. You can't change if you're doing it from afar. You have to be hands-on and you have to be really focused in what the goal is. And we have found when we are hands-on and we are also collaborating with the employees on ideas. You know, they themselves, you know, I have four gentlemen here that are constantly giving feedback, like this is the new ideas that they would like to see because they know their communities the best and they know kind of what t solutions or tools or change needs to happen. And so I think having that kind of constant communication is really um, necessary for change, you know, and, um, and we see that in, in our communities all the time. I mean, in terms of changes that we've made, I mean, there's, there's so many. I mean, there's funny ones, there's not, um, you know, it's, it's reaching out to the kids and teaching them about Trash for Cash is like a program we've done with the UN before where we've actually, you know, had them collect stuff on the beaches and then they make art from it and then they go and try to sell it so they can see almost the full end-to-end -end cycle of opportunities that are available to them if they're willing to actually try that. And I think um, we're quite successful with that and part of that is the culture of Kenyans. Beautiful. Uh, let's shift gears to, into creating an edge of creating uh, a regenerative business. I honestly consider your stories as a great example of regenerative businesses. And we know that regenerative business is one that gives back more to our planet and society than it takes. It redesigns work, cultivates human potential, achieves extraordinary outcomes. Tell us how we could ensure financial sustainability while being socially and environmentally responsible. How do we find how do we find this balance? To you, Sam. So I think um, you know there, there's a phrase when you know we're talking about the the, the globe in general, which is um, categorizing. Uh, you know, are you a first world country or are you a third world country? And I hate the phrase third world country. I'd much rather call. Um, a lot of those countries, first degree countries. 
And, and what I mean by that is uh, in, in, in the most regenerative communities that exist on the planet simply uh, uh, are able to see. And what I mean by that is what do we have around us, right? What do we have around us that we can use for whatever need it may be? How can we use what may be a negative in the case of the Bahamas, uh, you know, with uh, hurricanes that roll through? How do we see how uh, that impact uh, can be a positive? Um, how do we see how uh, what may be considered not having to look at all the abundance we have over here in this material? And so when you take a look at, for example, uh, the reject brine that we have or um, you know, the natural aggregates that we may have in a place, how can we put these things together and think about it in a way that is far more beneficial um, than if we were to simply um, use what is considered to be the right path, right? And I think that is really important to um, be your own judge of what is right, right? Be your own judge of what is acceptable. Uh, again, a, a quick uh, uh, comment about being an architect. When we build buildings, the code is written uh, based on what's already been done, right? So it's very, very difficult to then innovate and build something that may not have been done because it's not, for example, necessarily covered by code. So there's always this, this level of innovation that one has to go through to figure out, okay, how do we reach that goal? And I think uh, it's as simple as looking at what's around us. Yeah. Uh, Aaron, let's go to you. How are you measuring success in Ocean Soul? So we're interesting because um, Sam's in a startup situation and on a large scale. So we pivoted from a project idea that was helping a few women to how do we grow this? And the only way to do that was through measurements. Now I'm a statistician by nature, so it's measure statistics, what are the measurements that we need to drive to. So we track our impact measurements, which are number of flip-flops that we collect, number of meals that we served, um, tons per week that we recycle, um, um, how much, you know, what's our revenue. And it's quite interesting because for every flip-flop that we upcycle, that's almost the equivalent of a dollar. Now, um, so basically, if we've recycled about one and a half million flip-flops in a year, we're about one and a half million in revenue. Um, so it's quite interesting, and I think my job is to always say there's priorities. You know, are we are impact statistics more important than our profit? Um, and the answer is yes sometimes, and the answer is no other times. And so I think that financial sustainability has to be measured, and it has to be measured, you know, kind of um, on your major pillars of what you're trying to do, and they have to be somewhat always compromised um, to move forward. And so I think we've created that model. It's not fun all the time, but it does work. That's a great model. Sam, uh, Bartana Global, like as you grow and progress, how would you um, uh, stay true to your own mission and not kind of you know, as the giant company here around claiming to be uh, sustainable, but they're acting differently. How would you assure that in your uh, own startup? <laughs> yeah, that's always tough. Uh, that's always tough. Uh, you know, you look at, I remember when Apple in the 70s and 80s was, you know, a champion for education and coming to elementary schools and giving presentations, likening themselves to Da Vinci. And, and um, it's a much, much different company now. And I think, Look, you know, there's upsides and downsides to everything. You know, once you get to that level of scale and once that level of capitalization is involved, um, different criteria become more important. And so, um, you know, and even, you know, and even in our case, look, we, we, when we started, uh, we had a very simple idea. As we develop that idea, you start to realize these multiple different verticals that uh, are more and more attractive to, say, uh, uh, the general market. In our case, I think we're blessed in, in many ways. In our case, uh, our business model is really based around community, right? It's really based around giving uh, local communities around the globe tools with which they can build, with which uh, they can build beautiful things uh, and afford them, right? Not only that, they're doing it in a way that is using local resources and uh, pulling CO2 out of the atmosphere. And so we're hoping that because of that very foundational involvement of communities around the planet, 
uh, that will stave off some of the, uh, you know, uh, changing as we grow and as we uh, as we develop. I wish you all the success, and I'm sure you will have a great impact to the world. Now let's open the questions from our uh, lovely audience. We have two mics, one in the right, one in the left, and also our virtual uh, online audience. You could ask us questions. Yeah. Hello. Uh, my question is actually for Erin. Um, so I like the idea of Order and Soul very much, and it's uh, close to me because when I was in my undergraduate, a friend of mine and I, we were trying to uh, do something about the plastic waste situation inside the campus. So we were trying to collect trash bottles from certain parts of the campus, and then we found out it had three different components to it. The cap is made of a different material, the bottle is made of a different material, and the wrapper that goes around it is made of a different material as well. So we were trying to segregate it, shred it, make it into pellets, and at the end of it, we wanted to make something that was valuable to uh, something that we can sell. So we ended up making keychains out of it, mm -hmm. but then we weren't exactly sure who would be interested in buying the keychains. And the question that I had when you were presenting the uh, arts that you made at Ocean Soul was, so you're making flip-flops which had zero value at first because it was trash, and then you're adding it value to it because it's now an art. So where exactly is the consumer base for it, and how exactly did you uh, convert a project into a social enterprise and made it profitable uh, in the end? Uh, good question. So the cons our consumers, let me just start with them. Who buys our art? So um, universities, uh, corporations, um, people that want to show their commitment to conservation or potentially, um, like you saw, a, um, a panda bear. So a guy that does tours to the Antarctic, he bought that. So, you know, you have a lot of individuals that resonate with the art, whether we made it or how we make it, or probably both. So you have wholesalers, which would, I would say are boutique surf shops, zoos, aquariums around the globe um, buy our art. Uh, we have high net worth individuals that decorate their houses. They have garden art, so they'll buy some art. And you have to remember, we're big designers. These guys that are here, you know, they can take one picture, uh, as they did in the art that you've seen outside, and they can make the art. So um, I think when I came in in 2016, 2017, and I was working with Joe, who's here, he was there with me, we started um, thinking about, you know, actually we have huge value. This is art. This is not fine art, but this is contemporary art and it makes a statement. And so I, immediately coming from business, raised all the prices, I think, by 300%, I think was one thing. And I taught people almost value selling. I went out and said, you know, we are proud of what we do. They are not buying it just for this token of $20, $40, and some of our art is $50,000 to $80,000, some of the pieces that we have done. It is for what we, that it stands for, and it's for the impact that it can make. And so, um, and I'm kind of a pretty, pretty convincing salesperson, so I just kind of went out there. We've um, gone online now. We, um, we had that viral video that you all saw. At one point, it was literally, we had no online presence. Um, 180 million people were trying to get in touch with us, and um, so we went online, and that's been hugely successful. And we do sell uh, pretty much globally. We fulfill out of Kenya and uh, the United States. So. Um, I think it's just wearing our head high. We, are, we never deviate from our mission. Our story is very solid. We have impact measurements to, um, you know, I can go, I've been through procurements with, you know, huge companies and can stand there proudly of what we do and how we do it. And I think that makes a difference. And, you know, to go from kind of a project to actually being able to compete in business or in, with other kind of art, conceptual artists around the world. Thank you. Art definitely touches people's hearts and it, it makes a, a, a lasting emotional impact as well, which could uh, cultivate our behavioral change. Uh, any more questions from our audience? Go. Hi there. Hi. Hello. Uh, my question, oh, thank you all for the speech uh, and for the panel. Um, Sam, my question is, um, how do you plan from a business plan uh, to democratize this technology, mm. to let everyone um, use it. Because honestly, like when I think of it, how to convince my dad to build a house with that? And trust me that the, the green energy arguments will never gonna work for them and never gonna work for 95% of the people that are building houses. So have you thought of an idea on how to 
make this happen on a large scale and how to make it actually scalable over everyone. Uh, yeah, thanks for the uh, thanks for the question. Um, you know, just uh, the reality of this world is is really based on, uh, you know, how our markets work. You know, it's it's a capitalist uh, society, right? Um, and so we can look at our technology in a couple of ways. We can look at it as process, or we can look at it as product, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think when you get into um, to process, there's a lot of barriers to entry on that, and you're asking a lot of people to change. And so I think we'll eventually get there, but I think we start on a very, very basic level, and that's product. Something as simple as a concrete block. We can change the world with concrete block. I never thought I'd say that before, but it's true. We can uh, make them in any shape, size, and, and look at all the good it's doing. If we are making those in local communities, then they become affordable. If there is then an upside of being socially responsible, environmentally responsible, uh, and if it's at the same price, if not lower, then there's really no barrier. Um, again, going back to my partner Rick's statement, go where you're wanted, those people that will want to change the world will make those decisions to uh, uh, utilize that. As we grow, uh, we'll get into larger products, we'll get into, let's say, um, you know, precast panels and then poured in place. We're working with some companies right now around the globe that are using our mix in, in their developments, right? Um, but really, it's making it accessible to global communities, looking for local partners around the globe to use our technology to make products. Thank you. Yeah. And if I can build on that, like one idea I had, and it's an example that are being used also in the, in the solar panels in a, lot of, uh, in a lot of countries, how mm -hmm. to fund them. One way to do it is for banks, for example, or big corporates to fund these housing programs with loans and then the CO2 emission, they buy it as contracts, mm -hmm. and they make money through those contracts, and with very low interest rates, they give back the, the, the loans to the people that are building the houses, and that's like, I feel like that can be a good strategy in a way to encourage those people because they have two options, either take a normal loan, which has a higher rate of interest rate, or a lower interest rate loan, and using this contracts emission that the the banks will sell and make money out of it. I don't know if that's a feasible idea or not, but how you think about it? Uh, I love the way your mind works. Um, look, even if you're able to get a loan at all, uh, you know, uh, the majority of people in a lot of countries aren't even qualified to, to take a loan. And so I'm really excited about the carbon markets, the emergence of the, the carbon markets. Um, and I think, uh, uh, particularly through the Paris Accords, there's been a lot of global um, momentum behind that. So what does that mean? It's really an incentive for companies to build in a more responsible way. If you were built in a more responsible way and you can prove that, then uh, you're awarded carbon credits that you can use in multiple ways. Some can you know, sell it to companies that need to offset their credits, but what we really hope to do is take those uh, credits, uh, uh, put that into a, a vault, if you will, and use that for good. We're not there yet. Uh, we hope to be in the next year or two where we're able to use that, uh, that asset for home buyers, let's say and to be able to, to provide them a path of home ownership. The Bahamian government has been phenomenal in working with us, right? And so I think that's the other key, finding local governments that are, are willing to work uh, with you to, to provide a path. The reason they've been so supportive is because of all the hurricanes, they have to find housing. So they've been very supportive of um, guaranteeing loans for folks to get into those homes, right? They've also been supportive of this idea to even help them further with their down payment using, uh, uh, you know, the carbon credit as collateral. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks. Hello. Hello. Uh, very nice talk. And uh, I, I have a question to Uranus Smith. And first of all, I congratulate you to solve one of the biggest problem of solving the mesh management. Thank Actually, you. I follow the process of making from a flip-flop to the final product. And in order to make the final product, you are cutting and shaping the material and creating a lot of small pieces. Yeah. And uh, I read that the small pieces of uh, any kind of waste material are more severe to the, uh, rather than the big pieces. Mm -hmm. So how you deal with the small pieces which are uh, generated from that? So um, that's a good question, and that is uh, a big looming problem. But we solve it manually. As you saw in the video, we're a lot about manual, not machine. And that's purposeful for employment. But what we do with our, every night, Jonathan here is head of the workshop, and they clean up the extra shavings, and they, we put it through a, um, 
what do you call it, a grinder, you know, a shredder. And that shreds into, and what we do with those is we do a couple things with those. We make mattresses that we send up to Dadaab, which is in North Kenya, which is the largest refugee camp in the world. And so these mattresses are quite heavy, but they're durable. Um, they're made with safari net, you know, kind of netting for safaris. And so that is one program that we do, and we do that with um, Red Cross and some other, um, like again, remember I said we're an open platform, so we'll, we'll provide those. We sell them to rich Americans as dog beds, um, and so we do lots of things with that. Um, the challenge, and, I, and I've talked to some of the professors here, you know, this flip-flop material, you can't really burn it. There's not much you can really do with it, and um, I'm not in the business right now. My brain is not a science to figure out what to do with this medium. So we kind of say we're just prolonging the problem without trying to add more to it. Um, and so we haven't really solved that problem, but what we do is get it out of the environment, you know, contain it, if you will. We've put it, some of it in some of our bigger sculptures. We've done that. I mean, we're very creative with our waste. I mean, you know, our glue, some of our glue stuff goes into the middle of a sculpture. Um, we try our best to, to have a zero impact, um, but without a long-term, what I would call reformation of the material, um, you know, we only can do what we're limited to do with. Thank you. You're welcome. Now, I, I would, you have, okay, let's take from that. Please introduce yourself and hello. tell the audience yeah, from hello. where you're coming. My name is Osama. I am from Thuwal High School. I want to uh, ask you, Mrs. Zirin, first, uh, thank you for your effort. I want to ask about this flip-flop art, okay? Yeah. Uh, does, it, does it have any harmful effects on our health? Like, for example, my sister, she eats everything. Absolutely everything, my finger, my ears, anything. So if she tried to eat this flip-flop, uh, does, does it have any harmful effect on her or anything like that? Well, is it safe? How old is your sister? <laughs> She's young, I'm kidding. But, um, Five years, six years. <laughs> so, no, it is um, FDA approved because um, you know, we do not suggest that we sell them as toys. Uh, but people do, grandmothers buy lots of them, especially the smaller ones. Um, they can go into the bathtub. Um, nobody has been harmed um, from that. You have to worry about some of the pieces like a rhino nose or the giraffe ears. Those are, you know, obviously are harmful. But there is no toxicity that will be impacted impacted um, now that I, you know, I don't suggest somebody swallows them and tests that, but um, we have gone through FDA and some of the U.S. processes in order to sell them at that level. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. Thank you. What's a fascinating, wonderful discussion. I'd love to invite you, Sam and Erin, for your final remarks. Uh, if you'd like to, you have one minute each. Or less, if you'd like. I think if I, you know, you guys are all amazing. What an amazing university you are um, all attending here. I mean, I'm just in awe. Um, I think one thing, if you want to go into the social enterprise change management kind of business, I think doing things in an open manner, and I mean with an open heart, with an open business model, collaboration. Where I have seen failures in... Um, Kenya in particular around like conservation is when people hoard information, they hoard credit, they want the, the glory, and they're not willing to share amongst others to benefit all. And I think that's my one lesson that I would say as, as you young are getting out there and changing the world, you know, we are better together than we are alone. And um, applying that to not only your daily life, but in your business life and in your innovation life is going to be critical to your success. Wonderful, Sam. You know, so uh, just to kind of um, bookend this discussion, which is the edge uh, and going beyond the edge, I, I really encourage everyone to understand how powerful you are on the inside, uh, that if you find that voice uh, and you stick to that, things will eventually present themselves. I had no idea when I went on this journey, for example, that this material was going to absorb CO2. Uh, we just simply wanted to build better. And I think if you stick to that uh, path, uh, verticals will open up, opportunities will open up, as long as uh, uh, you stick to that voice. I hope you remember two things at the end of this, at least better together and find your own voice. Thank you so much. Let's have a look. Thank you. And now remember that uh, your gifts, please go to the web team to give you your beautiful little sharks from Ocean Soul.
Yeah, so find a chair that has something under it or I tagged think, on it. Let's see. If, I think all chairs have been thinking. Thank you.